Hi, in this video we will look into understanding PID control and those who already know the PID control will still be able to grasp something out of this. So let's start. Uh, first of all we have to understand why are we wanting to control any system. So we already know that we like to uh, control the system because uh, we want it to be a stable system as in we want this uh, system to be controlled at a particular equilibrium point. If there are perturbations, if there are practical impract impracticalities into the system, certain uh, disturbances into the system, still one has to be, uh, one, one has to ensure that it comes back and converges to the equilibrium point or a set point in terms of uh, classical control uh, terminology. So now uh, we look forward for making the system, ensuring that the system is stable under the errors, disturbances or practical um, circumstances. The second point that we look at is accuracy. So if I want to consider that okay, I want uh, the system to reach to a particular set point or it looks forward for tracking a particular uh, signal, then what is the accuracy by which the system is able to reach to that particular set point or attract or, or able to track the, track the signal. The third point that we look forward for control is responsiveness of the system. If the system is able to respond but very slow responding system may or may not be a good idea to, um, to continue with that system and there we would like the control system or controller to take part in improvising the time response of the system. We also look forward for robustness purposes for controlling the system. System is going to, we, we design a particular controller, The today it is working, after 10 days, after 1 year, the model parameters are anyway going to change. The system is because of the aging issues, because of the environmental changes the model parameter or the system characteristics are going to change and, be, and based on this if I need to make sure that the controller is still performing some good job is what I am looking forward for robust control system. Having known these terminologies what we look, look into is now designing certain matrix based on which I would be able to say okay the system is stable, accurate or responsive enough or it is robust. So for the stability we already know that the stability criteria are already uh, been, uh, been described especially for the linear systems, transfer function way we look into bounded input, bounded output stability. For uh, more, more enhanced versions of the stability or more, um, more more, um, more strict versions of the stability are asymptotic stability, exponential stability and, and what not. For the system to be accurate, we typically look into the steady state error. What is the steady state error and are we, able, are we okay with that particular error or not? Responsive, we describe the, the, uh, the uh, matrix using rise time, peak time or settling time. Robustness, the controller is able to reject the disturbance, robust, ro uh, it is also robust to the model parameter variations or not. Okay, so now we, these are, now, now we know that these are the typical requirements for the, con requirements coming up for designing a controller. We set out the control objective in terms of stability, accuracy, responsiveness or the robustness. There is, since the controller is also working with the practical system, there is a possibility that we will not be able to take care of all four kinds of the, uh, the requirements that the controller is supposed to do. So, so we have to make sure that uh, we are having some, we, we are taking care of the trade-offs between this. For example, if I am taking care of stability, I may be losing out on the responsiveness criteria. Fair enough. So one has to describe it very particularly what is the priority requirement 
fine. So once the priority is set out, then one can look forward for designing the controller with, with understanding that okay, this is what is my, this is, this is for, for which I am designing the controller. Moving forward, if I have to design the controller, this is the typical way I look into designing a controller with the help of um, closed loop control, negative feedback methodology and so on. So this, this particular diagram basically is introduced to describe the, uh, the terminology. So we have a plant which is system and, uh, and, and then I am controlling it with the help of controller. The system has an output Y and the control input U or so in terminology wise we say this is uh, the U is a control variable or a manipulated variable whereas Y is my output variable, process output variable or a process variable in itself. Now the controller is receiving the input as error input, error variable and error of what? the set point that I want to select, uh, that, that, is, uh, that, that we would like the output to follow. So the set point is now set as YSP and this YSP minus Y gives you the error, it means the output is deviated from, uh, how much the output is deviated from the set point, okay. We already know what are the advantages with uh, the negative feedback system. The negative feedback system is able to, to uh, take care of the disturbances, process variations and because it also has the relationship between the variables in a system. Relations as in what is, what, what is the output coming out and that output is fed back in order to take care of the what command to be given to the plan. Alright, uh, let us see what are the simple forms of feedback now. Before moving to the PID, in order to give, take the benefits of the, or, or the advantage of the PID, one has to understand what, why are we implementing PID or why are we not able to solve the problem in a very simplistic manner. The PID itself is a simple, simple controller, but at the same time, can I do a much simpler way? Can I design the controller in a way, much simpler way? All right. So, there is, there are methods available that let us look into that. The first one is the on off control. The on off control says that okay, if my error is positive, if error is positive, then I am giving some u max. When error is negative, then I am giving some negative command. Fixed positive command and fixed negative command based on the sign of the error. This is fairly okay and, and this works. But at the same time, what happens is that the process variable or the output oscillates as the system overreacts to a small changes in the error. So very small change in the error, you will be just simply toggling between the plus command and the minus command. And if you are toggling so much, it means you are changing the control input very much, then you are drawing the energy of the system. So one has to also Make sure that do, do we really want to toggle that, that frequently or do we really want the errors to be almost zero or what not. So you can see that just, just near the zero you are just simply toggling between plus and minus which may not be desirable, right. So then, then we came up with this dead zone criteria, alright. So in this dead zone we say that okay, the error is zero, if error is zero, command is 0. If error crosses by some plus value, some, some plus delta value, then I will give some command plus command or if it is negative then uh, negative threshold value then I will give the command input. But then what is the issue is that error is 0, command input is 0, if command input is 0 the output is going to be 0 after some time. So, what is not desirable is that if error means output is equal to zero, is equal to the set point, so that time error is definitely zero, which is desirable. But the command input need not be zero. If command input goes to zero, output will slowly become zero, and it will deviate from YSP. 
So this is what is not desirable. Now let's see what, what next we can do is the hysteresis kind of thing. So in this case, if I am, if, uh, so what, what this hysteresis says is that if the output error is, if the error is positive, then the output is positive value. But even if the, even if the error becomes little bit of negative delta, still I will keep giving positive value. And then if it crosses that negative value, then I will go to the negative command values. Similarly, if I'm coming from the negative side and I will, I will be okay with some positive error, and then I will switch to the, uh, if it is, the if error is, if error is more than this particular positive value, then I'll switch to, that time I'll switch to the positive command value. So the advantage is clear now that it is not, when error is zero, the command input is not zero. And at the same time, it is taking care of the issue with the on-off control that it is not toggling that frequently. All right. Of course, this is methodology is very nice and this is typically used in your air conditioners too. You, you will see that the temperature value, if you, if you set out a temperature value so to say 27 degrees centigrade, your body is not going to make to, to, uh, to understand that this is exactly 27 degree temperature in the room. You will be okay with 26 to 28 degrees centigrade. So that's the reason. If the if you are, if there's no need to toggle at exactly 27 degrees centigrade. So you can one can look forward for designing this hysteresis kind. It, hysteresis is again on off kind, such that you are only giving plus plus command value or a negative command value. So you are you are you are either cooling or you are increasing the temperature. So you are shutting down your uh, your conditioner air conditioning. All right, fine. So now let's see what next for us. So here in the on off case, of course, we were unable to reach to exact set point, but we were, we were okay with a band of values around the set point. But if the requirement comes that the control objective is such that I want to reach to that particular set point and stay there, stay there, all right? So then what we will look into is designing a proportional controller. Now this proportional controller, we already know its structure. It is uh, the command input is equal to the proportional gain times the error, ysp minus y. All right, so, but what happens again here that when error is zero, your command input is zero. So your process variable will often deviate from the set point. As, as, we, as we saw in the on off control case. So then fine, so then let's look into integral control. Now what integral control does is it integrates the, the error from time t equal to zero to a particular time instance, a current time instance, and of course it is multiplied by the integral, integral control. So in this case what happens is when even when the error is zero, since there is a residual accumulation of error in, in terms of the integral term, what we get is your, uh, uh, there's a possibility that uh, the system is, uh, th there, there is, there, there is some, some, some part th that comes up here. But if it is a, a pure integral term, then what happens, pure integral term, then what happens is u naught is equal to k, ki e naught times t. If you have residual error remains, means there is a some, some constant error is there, then what happens is this particular term u naught is going to keep increasing because there is a term t term turning out to be here. So it is the steady state output st or steady state control input is equal to the steady state error zero, e zero times t. So this is not a steady state because this particular steady state is a function of time. Therefore, in order to, so, so this is contradicting that this is a steady state because your 
if the control input is changing definitely your output is changing so this is this is not the this is this cannot be the condition it contradicts that this is a steady state and therefore we say that error steady state error has to be zero if it's an integral control so something similar we can have the proportional integral control term so if you have proportional plus integral term that takes care of making the steady state error to zero the integral term make sure that the steady state error term goes to zero whereas the proportional term will make sure that you are approaching the error approaching the uh, the steady state fast all right similarly this particular pid term which has the gain term multiplied by the error which is your k times e of t is your proportional gain this is my this this is the form in terms of the integral time constant or k by t i is nothing but your integral gain term next comes your derivative term which is k times derivative time constant times the derivative of error with respect to time now if we look at the the properties from the integral term we are having the past errors it is taking the accumulation of all the errors in terms of your integral term whereas your p term is taking care of the present term present error and this d by dt of e of t takes care of the future if i consider the derivative as a derivative as the or, or consider as a linear explore extrapolation of the error as e plus d e by dt so that is what you have is more or less taking care of your future errors so in combination of this past error present error and the future error future error is nothing but your prediction that you are looking into and this prediction of course is going to be good if your error is not changing very fast all right so that's what um uh, Uh, that's what the interpretations of proportional integral and derivative terms are and now let's look into what is the history of this pid control we are still studying this pid control which is approximately 250 years old and the claim here is that 90% of industrial control is still pid you will soon understand that why this pid control methodology is so powerful when we will simplify the methods and we will try to see that con certain control objectives are uh, con certain control objectives can be satisfied just by the implementation of pid control but the implementation of pid their structures their different ways of implementing the pid is very important to learn here and which structure will fit into a particular uh, process model or or particular system characteristics is very important to understand and you would be able to design pid control to satisfy certain control objectives um, uh, by learning through this course we see the history as 250 years old but at the same time these first controllers were all mechanical they were designed for windmills or steam engines the next came the era of pneumatic signal transmissions and these were the the this is the era that brought the industrial process control sensing control and actuations were sep were still separate and then uh controllers were sitting at us in into a separate control room so all the sensing data is coming to the controller uh and control is being done at the at at a control station and then the actuation were was done at a different place all together there come the, came the era of 19 in 1950s electronic controllers mainly using op amps they were designed 1970s the introduction of microcontrollers changed the the controller uh, to design of the digital controllers and this also added functionalities such as auto tuning adaptations 
and diagnostics and and of course it opened the use cases of controllers controllers and control systems like anything then in 2000s these digital implementation implementations were done using the with the help of fpgas mainly to customize the the controller designs and at the same time very fast short very fast to take care of very fast sampling rates because by fpgas i can design my own digital logic and would be able to um, would not be necessarily designing using the all functionalities of microcontrollers i can customize my digital design as well in fpgas so that was major advantage that we got from dis designing controllers for fpgas now newer trends is back to the analog implementation with the quantum computing with the analog computing uh, being explored and with these mems devices micro mechanical electrical systems where we are again going back to this analog era where the the controllers were designed using opamps where when we not to worry about the transition to tra uh, this is the the transformation of continuous signals to discrete signals which is which is involving further approximations and so on one can still work with continuous signals and design the controllers in analog domain that's all for for this lecture this particular video we'll move to the next one thank you